So I had just finished work and I needed to go and pick up some flowers for my girlfriend at my local Target. I was also going to head to an office supply store because there was a picture I wanted to print for her. It was a picture of both my girlfriend and I in front of the castle at Disneyland during the Christmas season a couple of months before. I actually already had the frame. All I needed to do was just print the picture, slide it in, and bada boom, bada bing. Anyway, picking up the flowers is pretty normal. I actually bumped into an old classmate from college and we chatted it up for about 5 minutes. Then I got into my car and drove 2 minutes over to the office supply store. As I walk in through the front sliding doors, some cheesy romantic music playing over the intercom systems, a strange, heavy set man seemingly just bumps into me and starts ranting at me for no reason at all. I just chose to walk away, figuring that he was just having a bad day and then left it at that. I went over to the area where they're doing the printing of pictures, and the female worker, who is around age 23, had tears going down her eye, and I could tell something was seriously wrong. Hey, is everything alright? She started telling me that the guy who just came into the store, the one I just bumped into, had been harassing her for the last few minutes and asking if she wanted to go out for dinner. He got very aggressive and even threatened her, but that's when for whatever reason he just did a 180 and left. I know for a fact that if someone were to do that to my girl, I punched them straight in the face. Anyway, she said she already told her manager and that she was just glad that he was gone. She clears her tears that are falling down her cheeks and now proceeds to help me with printing my picture. I emailed it to the company email since from there she's able to pull it up with a code that's sent over to me. As this is happening and I'm waiting a few feet from the main front counter, I happen to look in the direction of the front entrance. This is to my left where I just walked into the store. The creep I bumped into now returns and it seems he's fiddling around with something in his pockets. I took one look at the worker and she pretty much froze in place. She would later tell me that she felt like she was a deer stuck frozen with headlights shining in her eyes. It really was that bad, I'll tell you. I tell the guy he needs to leave and that she wants to be left alone. And I kid you not, the creep pulls out a utility knife and threatens me saying that he was going to stab my eyes out. A few other customers could then be heard screaming as they see the situation unfolding before them. Now I'm just standing there in fight or flight mode. Do I run and let this jerk potentially start attacking this worker, a customer, or me? Or do I say, no way, I fight back and try to take control of the situation? Well, I don't really know what came over me, but as he started to walk closer, half paying attention to me and half to the girl, I grab his wrist with all my might and begin twisting it in the opposite direction. The guy starts hitting me and I'm doing the best I can to dodge his punches. He manages to connect quite a few blows to my main torso, but I don't give in. Eventually, I wrestle the utility knife out of his grasp, suffering a few cuts in the process, and the guy now backs up, before in one last ditch effort, trying to take the knife away. I punch him right in the face, like I wanted to earlier, and the guy falls over like a log a nearby display cushioning his fall. Bear in mind, police had already been called and were on their way. Long story short, I ended up being questioned by the police and I ended up going to the hospital to get checked up on. It was mostly my girlfriend that wanted me to do that since she freaked out I told her of what happened. Needless to say, I later learned the creep was arrested and he was barred from ever going to that store ever again. I returned back to that same printing store a few weeks later, and when the girl saw me and my girlfriend, she introduced herself to my girlfriend and told her how thankful she was for helping that day when this mad man could have potentially gone on a stabbing spree. My girlfriend was so happy to hear that, and after some talking, the manager came out and told us that if we ever needed printing done, just make sure to go ask for him and he could help us out. That was so cool of them. Anyway, it's a different kind of scary Valentine's Day experience, but since it is that time of the year, I figured I'd go ahead and share it with you. I hope you all got a kick out of this experience that I went through, but if there is something I would like to advise,
please be very careful playing hero. Only intervene in a situation if you think you can handle it. Even then, how do you know if the bad guy might not be carrying something like, let's say, a gun? I didn't think about it in that moment, but it's scary when I look back on it. I'm a 6 foot 200 pound male and he was about 5 foot 10, 250 to 270 pounds. A bit of a weight and height difference, that's for sure. But again, the fact he tried to stab me with a knife says everything about a person's true intentions. I'd like to submit something I experienced about seven years ago. It's a true story that happened in my old neighborhood. I was in elementary school with my two sisters. Mary was 13 and the oldest. I was 11 and the middle child. And my little sister Emily was 8. One day at school, I witnessed a little girl being forced into a blue vehicle. She was crying, but the man forcing her in was trying to shut her up. That day, we had indoor recess. They had something to do with a blue vehicle and a missing student. The teachers locked the school entrance and warned the class to look out for a blue car. Every morning, we would catch the bus at 7.15 and I would always look out for an adventure so I would always pay attention to everything that happened. One day, we were waiting by the bus stop as per usual, when I spotted it. Across the street sat a man inside a blue car. He had black hair and sunglasses. His windows were always open and we could see inside the car easily as well. It looked like he had pink seats and cute puppies with toys. It was strange, especially because he was only staring at us. We were the only people who were at the bus stop, so it wasn't like he was watching his kids or anything. I didn't say anything at first, but then I started seeing him regularly. I pointed him out to my older sister Mary, joking that the man was stalking us and he probably wanted to kidnap someone. We all started laughing, but then realizing the situation we got scared. Eventually the bus came and we all sat in the back. As the bus was moving I turned around to stare at the window, and to my horror the blue car was following us. I scream and I inform everyone about the man that was following us. At that point everybody was crowded at the back trying to have a glimpse of the man. The bus driver told us to sit down and it was probably nothing but she looked scared. Realizing he was spotted though the blue car turned out a corner and then disappeared. We all now calmed down but two minutes later he showed up again and we all noticed. After that incident we stopped seeing the man but we'd still experience weird things. Like one time, my cousins and I were playing in the backyard. We had a gate at the back that opened to the alley and led out to the bus stop. At one point, one of my cousins opened the gate, and we began playing tag in the alley, but this is when a small white puppy began running towards us. It was very similar to the puppies in the blue car. We fed it some chicken, but as I was feeding it, it tried to bite me. We now realize that this puppy was very aggressive, as well as very rough. We also noticed the puppy had a blue mark painted on it. Before, we didn't pay it any mind. But the more I think about it, the more I realize. It must have belonged to some sort of gang. My mom told us to stop playing in the alley and stay close. After that, the puppy disappeared. But we forgot about the situation until now. Emily told me that when the puppy disappeared, she heard a loud whistle and the dog began running to a man dressed in black who stood in a corner. Was the puppy the same puppy from the blue car? Was he using the puppy as bait to kidnap us? And sometimes I wonder, what would have happened if we ended up following the puppy and towards that man? So my scary story starts when I was 27 years old. Just to give some context, I'm a 29 year old man, now weighing 290 pounds, and I'm 6 foot 4. Two years ago, I worked at a mill, and me and my co worker, who we will call Jim, worked the night shift as security guards. One night, we were watching the cameras as per usual, and we swear that we thought we saw a figure at the corner of our eyes on the cameras. We looked and saw what seemed to be a shadow, so we checked the other cameras and it was just a mop and a hanger. So we wrote the whole situation off as nothing more than the shadows playing tricks on us. Later that night we saw something moving in the dark, so I sent my co-worker Jim to go check it out. Meanwhile, 
I watched them from the cameras. He radioed back and said that there was nothing there. So while being just a bit creeped out, we continued on with our normal shift. Later, we heard a loud bang as if a crowbar or axe hit a piece of sheet metal. We both ran over to check it out, and we saw a man roughly looking in his late 40s, around 6 foot 6, holding an axe. My co-worker Jim calmly said, This is private property, and you have to get off, or we're going to call the cops. The man just stood there and pretty much said that we were going to have to force him out ourselves. The man then started to walk towards us, us only having a taser and pepper spray. Needless to say, we each booked it out to the camera room and called the cops and also let our boss know that there was a homeless man in the mill with an axe. After we called the cops, we looked to see if he was near slash close to the room on the cameras. After we checked, we saw nothing and we told the police that we saw nothing near our room. Shortly after that, the police arrived and they got our statements. They would then tell us a short time later after that that they had caught the man and he was inside the mill, as you'd expect, and we were so relieved that he was caught. After all that, I still work there to this day, but I now carry a gun. I also have a wife, two girls that I love very much, and life has now pretty much returned to normal. Anyway, if this makes it into one of your Creepy Fox podcast videos, I'd like to say thank you and have a great day. Hey everyone, the Creepy Fox here. Really quickly before we continue, to those of you who are subscribed to the channel, just go ahead and make sure you look down below the video and just check to make sure you're subscribed. YouTube is doing that thing again where they're unsubscribing a lot of people for whatever dumb reason they're doing it for. So I just wanted to go ahead and remind you all since I know there's so many of you who look forward to these uploads and then YouTube unsubscribes you or they don't notify you. It's really weird. But yeah, anyway, let's go ahead and continue on with these scary stories. Hey, so this is a story that I featured uh, roughly about three years ago, but since I've gotten so many brand new subscribers, I thought I'd go ahead and reintroduce it on this brand new episode. I've gone ahead and re-recorded it and remastered it, so here it is. This happened two years ago, on the day of my 28th birthday. I was working at a small, double-sided drive through only coffee stand about 30 minutes outside of Seattle. I've been working there for about a year at this point and was always scheduled to work the closing shift during the week and the opening shift on the weekends. In the seven years I worked as a barista at this point, I had yet to ever experience anything like what I encountered that day and it is my deepest hope that I am never faced with it ever again. It was a Thursday around 6.45 p.m. I was preparing to close the stand at 7 p.m. as per usual and it was rare that I would have many customers come through the stand past 6.30 p.m. Because of this, I was surprised when I looked up from cleaning the espresso machine to see a walk-up customer waiting at the open window, smiling at me. For safety reasons, I normally refrain from serving walk-up customers after dusk, but because the window on the side of the stand he approached at was already opened, I was kind of forced to acknowledge him. Reluctantly, I decided to serve him. He introduced himself as Ivan. He was around my age, seemed reasonably well kept in the sense his clothing and overall appearance looked pretty clean, and despite a slight accent, his English was very good. His eyes, however, were utterly unnerving. His gaze made my stomach feel uneasy. Immediately, my intuition was alerting me that something about this individual was very wrong. Every red flag possible was beginning to show in my mind and I could not shake the deep, almost overwhelming sense of darkness that I felt coming from this person. There was an evil in him that I couldn't ignore, though I would soon find out exactly why I was feeling this way. After greeting him as politely as I could, I managed despite my growing hesitations, preparing my machine to make him a drink. However, he didn't seem to know what he wanted to order, and I asked him twice what I could get started for him, 
Before I silently recognized the fact that he was very likely not here for the coffee, eventually he abandoned ordering altogether and instead directed our attention toward small talk. He asked me where I was from, how long I'd been working at this stand, etc. I answered each of these questions with short, abrupt answers, hoping my tone and clear lack of engagement would convey the fact that I wasn't really interested in continuing any further conversation since he was not a paying customer and because I was about to close. After a long pause, he asked slowly, So, do you have a boyfriend? Annoyed, I replied, No. At this point, I was completely ready to end our conversation, so I told him that I needed to finish closing up so that I could go home. Upon hearing this, he walked away from the window he had been standing at, and he mentioned that he was looking forward to seeing me again very soon. A minute or so passes, and he was out of sight, yet my gut told me that he was not, however, far away. I could feel his dark energy nearby, and I knew he was watching me from somewhere beyond my line of vision. Cautiously, I closed up the stand, locked the doors and windows, walked to my car, and drove home. By the following day, I had all but forgotten the encounter I had with the guy and went to work as per usual. 7pm rolls around and once again, I'm just about to end my shift and close the stand. I'm nearly finished closing out the register when a brief moment of movement catches my eye from outside the window on the opposite side of the stand. I turn my head toward the area in question and there in full view of both me and the security cameras stood the guy from yesterday. My stomach sank quicker than I knew previously to be possible and I was immediately very aware of how cold it was inside that stand. He smiled at me with a predatory like grin, waved, and then proceeded to pull open the window in front of him instead of waiting for me to cross the small distance within the stand that stood between us and open it for him as I usually would, and although he didn't present himself aggressively, there was something incredibly threatening about his choosing to do that. It left me feeling helplessly, hopeless, unsafe in that very moment, and that was not a feeling I was familiar with, or, as I learned, practically fond of. But once I was finally able to bring myself into a present state of mind again, I cleared my throat and told him as firmly as possible that I was off the clock and I wouldn't be able to make anything for him as my machine was already cleaned and my register closed out for the day. His smile widened further as he replied, It's okay. I didn't come to get the coffee. I came for you. Upon hearing this, I noticed a shift in the energy building between us. The fear I'd previously been overcome with now made a sudden and jolting transition into a redlining level of irritation. I don't care what you came for, I told him as sternly as I could manage. It's going to have to wait till tomorrow, because I'm closed. At this, he chuckled a bit before finally raising both his hands in an indication of surrender, saying, All right, all right, fair enough. His smile disappeared. His eyes now became even more focused on me, his gaze intensified. Then I'll see you tomorrow, he said, in a way that felt less like a statement and more like a threat. I swallowed hard, and once he was out of view, I rushed to the window and slammed it shut, throwing the lock into place. Again, despite not being able to visibly confirm his presence nearby, I knew that he was there, and I could feel his eyes fixated upon me. I left the stand quickly and got into my car to drive home. This time, however, he remained heavily on my mind for the rest of the night, robbing me entirely of any sleep. The following morning was a Saturday, so per my usual schedule, I got up insanely early to work at 5am. I arrived at the stand at 10 minutes to 5, and for the first few hours of my shift, everything was relatively normal. 8.30 a.m. rolls around and it's now finally no longer freezing and dark outside, as the November mornings here tend to be. The sun had broken through the clouds and was steadily burning them off. As I was admiring the weather out the window of the stand, I noticed a familiar truck pulling up to the stand. 
As it neared closer, I recognized it as my ex-boyfriend, Jonathan. I found this exceptionally odd since he and I were not currently on very friendly terms. This was thanks in part to his decision to end our relationship by sleeping with somebody else. Bear in mind, while he was still living with me at the apartment I was renting at the time, once he pulled up to the window I was now standing at, I asked him skeptically what he was doing here. I'm sure I'm probably not someone you want to be seeing today, I know, but I just wanted to come by and wish you a happy birthday in person and see how you're doing. Just as I was about to thank him for the birthday wishes and inform him that no, indeed he isn't someone I'd want to see that day, I was still pretty hurt from his cheating, I noticed someone about a hundred yards away approaching the stand on foot. It was Ivan. Suddenly, Jonathan's presence there at the stand with me shifted dramatically from unwanted to very, very appreciated. I whispered quickly to Jonathan that I needed him to stay here with me even if another customer pulls in for service behind him. That is of course until the man who just walked up is gone. I could tell he was able to register the fear in my eyes and he agreed immediately to stay. I turned to face the open window on the opposite side of the stand just as Ivan approached it. I walked slowly over to him and I noticed right away that he had been crying. His eyes were bloodshot and tears were still evident on his cheeks. Disregarding his obvious emotional state, I began to inform him that he needed to leave because I was not going to serve him and this is when he cut me off and he said, I don't need this anymore, you can have it. As he said this, he threw what I later came to recognize as his Russian passport, right into the stand through the open window. I picked it up, puzzled, and asked him why he would no longer be needing it. I just won't. Who the heck throws their passport at someone, I thought. I looked over my shoulder at Jonathan, who now had a what the heck is going on look on his face, and shrugged. I turned back to Ivan only to realize he was no longer standing in the window. I poked my head out the window to see where he had gone and I saw him rounding the corner toward the back end of the stand. I watched him walk around the stand in three full loops before he finally stopped once again at the open window. This is the point where the dynamics of our interaction shifted indefinitely. Ivan had stopped crying, his tears had now been replaced with a look of complete in utter insanity. God came to me last night in my dreams, he began. He told me that you will be my wife. He told me, you are my wife. A sickening smile crept over his face as my stomach literally dropped to the ground. You are my wife, he stated again. You are my wife and you will come with me now. At this, he began to lift himself onto the small ledge beneath the window in a sort of attempt to lift himself into the stand. Realizing what he was doing, I quickly slammed the window shut, locking it in the process. He pushed his weight back down off the ledge, paused, and then proceeded to give me a look that made me truly understand the meaning of having one's blood run cold. Before I continue any further, let me just say that until you personally experience a situation that demands you to access your fight or flight response, you have no idea what the response is going to ultimately be. I don't care how tough you feel you are. The type of fear that's required to activate this defense mechanism in the first place is more than most people ever realize, and how you will react will be involuntary. Until this point, I'd always figured to myself, be a fight type of person. I'm not, at all, and I came to learn that beyond any doubt on this day. By now I had dialed 911 and I was frantically trying to relay as much information as possible to the operator while attempting to keep an eye on Ivan, who was now at the back door, attempting to figure out the numbered key code to release the electronic lock securing the door. As I spoke to the 911 operator, I could hear the faint beep, beep, beep of the keys being punched on the electronic lock. Now, knowing that there would literally be a one and nearly infinite chance he'd manage to guess the four number code, I didn't feel too concerned with the thought of him gaining entry. That was until I felt my heart suddenly arrive at a complete stop in my chest 
as I listened to the fateful sound of the keypad indicating a successful code entry. This was followed by the loud and heavy thunk of the steel deadbolt retreating quickly back into the door, which unlocked it. In this moment, time stopped entirely. I no longer had a sense of it or of the space around me in which I currently occupied as I turned in what felt like slow motion to face the door, just in time to see it begin to be pushed open from the outside. I remember screaming involuntary as I watched a large knife enter through the opening of the door first, followed by Ivan's firmly gripped hand around it. Remembering at this point that Jonathan was still in his truck on the other side of the stand, I ran to the window and screamed desperately through the now closed and locked panel of glass. Jonathan, he's got a knife! Jonathan's eyes grew huge and he literally flew out of the driver's side of his truck towards the back door of the stand. I turned facing the back door, just in time to see Ivan step into the stand, a mere ten feet from where I stood. Now, for the rest of my life, I will never, and I mean never forget the look he had on his face as his eyes met mine. It was clear he knew that I was now helplessly aware of the reality of the situation. He looked intoxicated with a power that he knew he held over me in this moment. Now I have never felt so much hate come from just one person before. Until now I had hoped this type of evil, as pure as it revealed itself to be before me now, existed only in places far removed from the world I moved within. I had hoped that I would be luckily enough never to encounter it, as I harbored no desire whatsoever to make its acquaintance. Ivan took a total of two steps toward me before I saw an arm being thrown violently around his neck from behind. As I stood there in a state of paralysis due to fear, I watched as Jonathan pulled Ivan back by the neck with so much force his feet flew out from beneath him. Suddenly both Ivan and Jonathan were on the ground right outside the door, with Jonathan securing Ivan in a nearly impossible headlock to break away from. He was yelling at him strict instructions not to move, not a single muscle, or he was going to choke the life out of him. Surprisingly, Ivan remained completely still, never once making any signs of resistance. But Jonathan kicked the knife away from his reach and told me to pick it up and secure it until the cops arrived. Upon hearing this, I finally remembered that I was still on the phone with 911, who had heard what was happening on my end and dispatched every available unit within a 30 mile radius to my location, marking my call in the response system as the highest priority. It felt like hours before the cops arrived, but once I had a chance to look back on the duration of my 911 call, I realized that it had been a mere 4 minutes before over 30 local city, county, and state patrol units overtook the area. To this day, I've never seen so many cops respond to a single call before. At least six cops descended on Ivan at once, relieving the grip Jonathan had been holding around his neck and forcibly, more than necessary to my silent pleasure, detaining Ivan and carrying him, practically hogtied, into a waiting police cruiser. Apparently, while speaking with the cops after being securely restrained and unable to flee, Ivan insisted continually that I was his wife. God had told him, after all, that I was intended for him. I belong to him, God said. He was simply there that morning to collect that which he had been promised the entire time. This happened a few months ago when my husband and I were driving back home with our kids. We noticed a car behind us who was right on our tail. We were on a two lane road which means he could have easily passed us, but no, he was right on our tail. The speed limit was 40 miles per hour and my husband was going about 45, so it's not like we were driving super slow. Continue doing this for almost 5 minutes. At this point, my husband is angry and tells me that he's going to pull over. So he does, and the car behind us actually pulls over too and parks super close to our vehicle. Now let me quickly mention that my husband is 6 foot 4 and 240 pounds with tattoos all over, and I'm 5 foot 3 
but when stuff goes down, you're darn right I'm going to back up my husband. I show no fear, even if deep inside I'm really scared. So my husband and I get out of the car and we start shouting at the driver asking what his problem was. The guy behind the wheel is a white guy in his early 30s and I could tell he didn't expect a guy like my husband behind the wheel, let alone his crazy wife. So the guy actually crashes into the back of our car, all the while our kids were in the back seat. It's a good thing that the guy had his window down because my husband gives him a good satisfying punch to the face while I'm trying to open the guy's passenger door, not sure what I was going to do if it was open, but once you mess with my kids, you best believe it's not going to be pretty. But of course, his doors were locked. So then this dude goes reverse in his car and I'm freaking out because my three kids are still in the car, all with their seatbelts on. Now I'm scared that this psycho is going to ram into our car. I know I won't make it in time to get my kids out. My husband yells for me to get out of the way and instead of this guy crashing into our car, he just takes off. I'm yelling at my husband to get in the car and go after him, but he tells me no because the psycho is long gone and our four cylinder car will never catch up to him. So I'm pretty angry but asking my kids if they are okay especially my three-year-old who was still in a car seat. Luckily, they were okay, just a little shaken up and confused at what just happened. My seven-year-old son actually started laughing because his dad punched the guy, but we drove to a Harmon's parking lot since we had been on the side of the road. I quickly got out to check for any damages to my brand new car that I just got in a few days ago, but surprisingly, there was no dent or anything whatsoever, just a little scratch. I ask my husband if we should call the police, but he says there's no point. I agree since the psycho is long gone and there's no damage to my car. I'm left a little shaken up and just trying to comprehend what had just happened. Like are people really that crazy? Now I've experienced road rage before, but nothing like this. It wasn't until the next day that I started asking myself. If the guy really crashed into us on purpose, or if he had just panicked and instead of going in reverse, crashed into our car, I couldn't accept that he had done this on purpose. I mean, right? All I know is that people are crazy and you just never know what could happen out there, and you definitely never know who could be behind the wheel. So to the psycho, I hope you learned a valuable lesson that night, and I also hope that he woke up with the side of his face completely bruised. Hello again my friend. I can verify that the following tale is true. It was told to me by my mother and it's about something her two uncles experienced. This will show you that I am an old lady, but the original story of the old farmhouse happened in the late 1890s and the story with my great uncles was in the late 1960s. Strap in folks, it's a long one. Well, not really. And it is a true story, I just don't want to put too much detail. Not every town wants to be known as a haunted destination. Small town Texas before the turn of the century, 1890s. There is a nice two-story farmhouse on the corner of two roads. One road is used by farmers from other towns to bring their cotton crops to the gins in another larger town on the other road. The farmhouse had only one occupant, a middle-aged farmer that had lost his wife years ago and had no children at all. He noted the wonderful opportunity he was sat upon in being at such a major crossroad. Many farmers, weary from a long drive from whatever town they came from, would be wanting to sleep a bit before continuing on to the cotton gins. He waited, always until it was getting dark outside, and ask any weary, overloaded farmer driving by if they liked to stop and rest for the night. Being grateful for the break, the driver would gladly accept, taking the wagon around back and getting their horses settled for the night in the stable. After the farmer's guest was fast asleep, he would beat them to death, stealing their money and then hauling their body to the white picket fence surrounding his property. He would bury his victim by one of the fence posts, and then washing up as if nothing had happened. In the morning, he would hitch up his victim's wagon and travel to the gins with his horse tied to the wagon and sell the cotton. 
He then drove the rig to the livery in another town where he would sell the horses and wagon, riding his horse back home. This went on for a long time before the farmer was found out and hanged for his crimes. When the local sheriff decided to find out how many victims the farmer had, it was said that there was at least one body buried at each fence post, sometimes up to four. As you can imagine, the farmhouse was left with quite the reputation. Locals said that nobody could spend the night in that old house. Anyone that purchased it would not last a single night in its walls. They complained of terrifying wails and chains rattling. Some even experienced severe pain, as it felt as if somebody had struck them repeatedly with a heavy hammer. The town, needless to say, could not sell the home. It steadily became more and more run down. In the 1960s, the town decided to try and sell off the house again, in a sort of last-ditch effort to get somebody to take it. They advertised that if anyone could stay the night, just one night, in that house, the town would sign over the deed to them for free. Many people booked a chance to stay the night in this house as it was large. It was a Victorian style home with several acres of land that came with it. Easily it was worth a quarter of a million dollars at the time. In the 1960s, $250,000 was a lot more than it is today. For the most part, people would go in at around 8pm with a person from the town charged to watch all night and report when the person or people inside left so that there would be no cheating. None had ever made it past 2 a.m. Most were running and screaming by 10 p.m. My great uncles were pretty rough characters that had been farmers, rustled cattle. Yes, people still did that in the 1960s. I have another cousin that's on a watch list for it today and gotten into other shady stuff too. They figured that this could be their golden ticket and signed up. When their night came up, they went into the house and immediately as the door was shut, they felt a breeze move along their backs. Thinking it was just a draft from the door shutting, however, they decided to sit on the parlor floor, back to back, until dawn. They thought that since most of the killings happened in the bedrooms, the parlor would be safe. From what my mom told me, they never went into great detail of what happened but it greatly changed them. Neither was up for any dangerous behavior. They did say that they heard chains rattling, heavy footsteps, screams, moaning, and even saw a dark figure move up the stairs at the back of the dining room. One of my great uncles still has this scar on his neck where an invisible knife tried to slit his throat. Ultimately, what sent them running for home at 3 a.m., the longest time anybody had stayed in that house, was seeing an apparition of a blood-splattered specter that was counting coins and muttering, they'll fetch a good price. Oh yes, they'll fetch a good price. From what mom said, it was a few years later that the mayor realized the town would never be rid of that house, and so ultimately, it was bulldozed. Right now, it sits as unused land at an intersection of two highways. I do wonder sometimes, what will happen if they built something there. Hey everyone, so that was the last story for today's episode. Um, apologies in advance for there being such a huge delay between uploads. Uh, what happened was I ended up having some really bad allergies, so uh, I could have recorded the video and got it out to you guys, but uh, I would have sounded like this with my nose all plugged. And I don't think you guys would have liked that at all. Uh, so there was that delay. And then there was also the fact that uh, I was waiting on stories. I, I didn't really have any stories. Um, and you saw today that one of these stories that I featured, uh, that big, uh, I think it was what, like 16 minutes long. That is a story that was sent to me back in 2017. And while I have featured it one time before, I want to say it was about... Oof, I think early, it was either late 2019 or, or early 2020, uh, but since I've gotten so many new subscribers since then, I figured I'd, uh, you know, I'd go ahead and get it into this uh, big episode. And then regarding uh, Valentine's Day stories, apologies on that. Unfortunately, um, I did not receive any new Valentine's Day stories. I did get that first story that I featured today, 
That was a brand new Valentine's Day story. And I thought I had another Valentine's Day story um, somewhere in my saved stories, but uh, it, it ended up being a story that I've already covered before. So yeah, unfortunately, you guys only got uh, one brand new Valentine's scary story today. So again, sorry for that. Um, maybe uh, next year, if you guys you know wanted to send start sending your Valentine's Day stories, and between now and the next. Uh, 365 days, who knows, maybe we'll get to do a 2024 Scary Valentine's Day stories. Uh, so, uh, yeah. But hey, I wanted to go ahead and say thank you very much for uh, watching the videos. Especially the last upload, the Valentine's Day stories compilation. That thing has gotten over 15,000 views. That's something, that's a kind of viewership that I used to get back in, uh, I'd say... I think the last time I really got something that steady was 2019. I mean, I've gotten uh, over 10,000 views on videos uh, in the past couple years, but to get something in that time span, um, yeah, that, that's not really something I've seen. So uh, hopefully you guys will continue to do that uh, with this episode and uh, the upcoming episodes, because uh, that's really awesome that... Uh, you know you guys are giving my channel a chance because youtube has been punishing my channel and suppressing it for so long so if you guys keep uh kicking the algorithms butt and getting the videos out there then um hey that's really awesome <laughs> maybe uh soon who knows we'll reach 100,000 subscribers which uh would be super super awesome so please make sure to keep sharing the videos and subscribing uh, I don't really have much else other than uh, thank you to the wonderful channel members that support my channel and of course the regular viewers who watch the videos. I'm going to go ahead and uh, cut this short because I am recording this on Valentine's Day. It is 3.50pm as I record this outro. I still have to edit it, put it together, work on the thumbnail. I still want to get this out for Valentine's Day so you should be hearing this. Um, at least if you're in the U.S., you should be hearing this on Valentine's Day. But uh, if you guys are, are outside the U.S. and it's already the 15th, then a uh, happy Valentine's Day. A little bit late, but a happy Valentine's Day to you guys. And to, of course, uh, for those who are still in Valentine's Day time, uh, hopefully I'll see you guys on a new episode coming up soon. I don't know what that's going to be yet, so... Uh, Please just make sure to send in some scary stories and uh, we'll come up with something. Anyway, friends, that's going to go ahead and do it for today. I'll catch you all on the next episode. Take care and have yourself an amazing day.